my name is Jacob Totson. I recently sold nearly everything I own to travel Northern Europe in order to understand more about the ancient religions of the past. And today, I'm in Scotland to discuss the differences between Celtic and Nordic paganism. Welcome to Cairn Poplar, a 5,500 year old pagan site here in southern Scotland. So what makes this site so interesting is that despite it being in Scotland and what would be considered Celtic to many people, this is not Celtic. 5,500 years ago, these people were not Celts. We barely know anything about the people that would have held ceremonies here 5,500 years ago. And that's one of the precursors we have to have before we discuss too much into the difference between Celtic and Nordic is defining what this actually means. So when we're talking about the Celtic, we're talking about a very large area of central, western, and northern Europe, and a very large group of people that existed for hundreds of years uh, in various tribes and traditions, and what we actually know as far as written source material is very limited. So when we typically talk about Celtic beliefs today, we are talking about Irish beliefs, because the Irish sagas, the Irish cycles, are where we get most of our written source material. And so most Celtic deities that are known today, at least in prominence, are Irish deities. With that, there is also the Mabinogian in the Welsh belief system, uh, and then there's also the writings of Julius Caesar with the Gauls. And then, of course, we're left with a scattering of information from all around uh, Central Europe uh, when it comes to artifacts and, and sacred places of the past, but again, these can only give us so much information. Uh, because once again, this behind me here, is not Celtic, it's, it's a proto-Celtic, it's the people that existed here in Scotland before the Celts came. Now when it comes to the Nordic, we're left with a very similar issue. So Nordic can be interchanged with Norse quite commonly, I say it myself, uh, but what we're really talking about is Scandinavia, so Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and then up into Iceland as well. Uh, and then there's also Germanic paganism, which often gets roped in with Nordic paganism because they are very similar. Now there is a difference between Germanic and Nordic paganism when it comes to traditions and naming, but again, we're left with very little information from the Germanic, and so oftentimes they get combined quite easily. So the main written source material comes from Iceland when it comes to Nordic paganism with the prose and poetic Eddas, which many of you probably know. Uh, but there are other source materials we can kind of look into, including Saxo Grammaticus's The History of the Danes, uh, written in the Christian era, but it goes into a lot of detail about Danish paganism, Danish mythology, and history. And then we also have the writings of Tacitus with Germania, which is one of the only source materials we have when it comes to the Germanic people and what they did as far as religious practice is very similar to what Julius Caesar wrote when it comes came to the Gauls. And so we have this wide area divided between Celtic and what is Nordic and then subgroups of that with the Gauls, the Irish, the Welsh, and then you have the Danes, the Swedes, the Nords, and the Icelandic, and then the Germanic, and then the individual tribes of all this. Uh, so what I'm really trying to tell you here is this is a very complicated subject material. I would guess we only know about 5% of what actually happened in the past, if not less than that. So reconstructing beliefs today is very difficult. So just please keep in mind throughout this conversation that when we're talking about Celtic paganism, we're typically talking about or at least I am in this video talking about Irish beliefs that survive today that are typically the prominent figures of Celtic beliefs. And then when we're talking about Nordic paganism, this also talks about Germanic, Nordic, and then it's all coming from Iceland. It's all coming from Icelandic written source materials. And then with both, we have evidence within archaeology such as these sites. But again, this is not Celtic, so this makes, dif makes it more difficult. Now with that, let us talk about the gods of the Nordic pantheon and the Celtic pantheon and how there may be similarities but also their differences. So when comparing and contrasting the differences and similarities between the Celtic, Irish, and the Nordic deities, uh, it's kind of interesting because at first you might be inclined to say that some of the deities are very similar. When we look at gods such as the Dagda and Odin, they are very similar. They have similar aspects. They're both wandering, gray-bearded old men who have many children with many different beings and are part of a lot of different stories. They're both associated with magic. Uh, the Dagda is associated with druidry, whereas Odin is associated with Sather and rune work. Uh, but they're also both gods of war. But then the actual individual stories of them are quite different. And so more than likely, the Dagda and Odin have a similar root in history, uh, possibly a singular god that they are associated with, uh, and then they split off into their own unique stories. 
Now, where this leaves us as modern pagans is ultimately up to the individual interpretation. Some people may look at the Dagda and Odin and say, oh, they're so very similar, they might be the same deity, and so I'm going to worship them as the same deity. Some people would say that's wrong and you can't do that. Personally, what I believe is that they are two separate deities, because being here once again in Scotland and worshipping the Norse gods, they do feel like two separate things, and so I do feel that the Dagda and Odin are two separate deities personally. And the other reason I also say this is because these are the two most similar deities from my research. Uh, many of the Celtic deities and the Nordic deities do not line up that well. Uh, when we look at the Morrigan and Freya, once again, on paper, they might seem quite similar. The Morrigan is a goddess of war, of death. She is typically considered a very dark deity, a very heavy deity, uh, and then she's also associated with witchcraft. And then on paper over here with Freya, she's a goddess of war, a goddess of death. She looks over some of the dead uh, associated with birds, very similar to uh, the Morrigan, who's associated with birds as well uh, when it comes to crows and hawks. Uh, and then Freya is also associated with Sather magic and witchcraft. But many people who worship Freya today describe her as a very light deity. And then there's also a line within the Eddas that say Freya is a very easy deity to reach. And there's a whole story about someone building a cairn to Freya and reaching out to her. And so even though on paper they may seem very similar, the actual beings of Freya and the Morrigan are very different. Now one thing I actually found very interesting uh, is that the Celtic belief system does have a smithing god. Gods of smithing are also common within Greek and Roman belief systems, but within Celtic belief systems you have Goibnu. But what is unique about the Nordic belief system is they do not have a god of smithing that we know of. The closest would be Voland, who is mentioned in a story, who is a smith, but from what we know he is just an elf. And then we have the dwarves who are in charge of the majority of crafting of magical objects throughout Norse mythology. And so we have an entire group of beings associated with smithing, whereas we have a god of smithing within the Celtic belief system. Now, I also think it's very interesting that the Scandinavian peninsula and then the British Isles uh, are very associated with the sea. Uh, this is where they get a lot of their food, it's where they trade, it's where they wage war, it's how they get to other places. And so both people groups had very important connections to the ocean without a doubt. And yet we know very little about the Norse gods of the sea. We know about Njord, but we know very little of him besides the fact that he has good looking feet. And then we have the Jotnar of Aegir and Ron who are associated with the sea as well, uh, but they're quite negative when I believe uh, most people look at their relationship. But again, we, we know very little about Aegir and Ron. And then there is some association with Thor and the sea, but very little uh, when it comes to the controlling of storms. But within the Irish belief system, we have Mananan MacLear, who is a very prominent deity and is associated with the afterlife, but is also a god of the sea. Uh, and so it's interesting that I believe that the Nordic belief system probably had some very interesting rituals and spiritual connections to the sea and the oceans, but we don't know that much that survives, whereas we can see within the Celtic belief system that they did have a prominent connection to the sea with Manan and MacLear. All too often within polytheistic belief systems, uh, we associate deities with singular aspects a little too much. And I think this is sadly a slight problem when it comes to uh, the Roman and Greek understanding of the god of war, the god of love, the god of death. This is actually where the Celtic and the Germanic and the Nordic are very similar, is that the gods don't typically fall into these categories of the god of love, the god of death. They have many different complex uh, things about them. Uh, let's look at the Celtic goddess Brieg, or Brigid, one of the most prominent deities that survive today, and she's associated with new life, with spring, with fire rituals, with healing and magic, uh, and is the primary deity of Ireland uh, as she survives within St. Brigid and still has a holy day, and is the chief goddess of the celebration of Imbolc. And then we have Frigg within the Norse belief system, who is a mother goddess. She is the wife of Odin, but then she has her handmaidens, which have so many different aspects. And then we have the actual story of her sitting on Helanski off the throne of Odin, and her and Odin making a bet about two different boys uh, on Midgard, uh, and her winning the bet and being quite cheeky with Odin. Uh, and so she's a very complex character, just as Brigid is, or Brige. And so, you know, they're not just goddesses of one thing. The deities don't just have one component within Celtic and Nordic belief systems. Uh, but I could sit here all day and compare and contrast the various different deities that exist. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say is that the Celtic and the Nordic deities really aren't the same. While they may have commonalities between them, and it's up to you to determine how far you take that, uh, that belief uh, when it comes to deities such as the Dagda and Odin, ultimately they are very different, uh, and they come with very different traditions and stories and, uh, and values as well. 
So I hope that all makes sense. This was a very hard section to film because I, I thought about just giving you a list of the Irish deities, giving you a list of the Nordic deities. I mean, like these all kind of make sense, but I don't know how much that actually helps you. So I figured this conversation around the similarities and differences of the two pantheons may be a little bit more helpful. Let's take a wee break in the middle of this video simply to say if you're enjoying it please make sure you like and subscribe and all that good youtuber stuff but also if you want to support this channel even further to ensure i can continue to come to places like this to discuss topics like this with all of you please think about supporting me on patreon because this video did actually cost quite a money to make uh, simply for renting the car and doing all of this in one day all the expenses around that i've traveled all across this area so if you do want to support me and the creation of this content truly i would not be able to do it without the amazing people on patreon otherwise i have also written a book recently called a yule story and i'm also working on the sequel right now called a midsummer's tale so you can pick up a yule story right now on amazon and a midsummer tale coming out very soon Before we leave the Karen Poplar, I do want to talk about holy places as well because they're actually very similar to both the Celtic and the Nordic. Now again, we have to talk about the complicatedness of the fact that this site is not Celtic, but it was used by the Celtic people because it's been used from, uh, you know, from 5,500 years ago. This site has been used for religious purposes, uh, both by people 5,500 years ago, by the Celtic people. Uh, people added the burial chamber here later on, and then Christians even added graves here as well. So this site has been seen as sacred. And this is very similar to the Nordic and Germanic as well, as holy places have been transformed from sacred graves groves and healing wells into sacred sites for Christianity and Catholicism. And so while a lot of the original sacred sites have changed names, typically they have pagan origins. And oftentimes it's just a little harder to find them, such as Arthur's Seat here in Edinburgh. It has Catholic reasons of why it's sacred, but those ultimately come from pagan reasons as well. And I experienced this in Germany as well as Denmark as they're like, oh, this is Saint so-and-so's place but more than likely it was a sacred grove to some pagan deity back in the day. So the similarities between Celtic and Germanic and Nordic are definitely within sacred groves, stone circles, and sacred sites, such as the one here at Cairn Poplar. Now with that, we do have some evidence of an interior temple holy place of uh, Sweden and Uppsala. So there possibly were more structured buildings within the Nordic, but these came quite later from what we know. Uh, and while there are some more elaborate uh, buildings within the Celtic world, again, it's hard to say how much it was actually used by the Celtic people. Uh, but ultimately, it seems that the wooden temple was more of a late addition to the Nordic belief system, whereas here, I don't think it ever really picked up. Um, maybe that's just because uh, the Celtic belief system disappeared earlier than the Nordic. But the thing to take away, sacred groves, stone circles, sacred places, Celtic and Nordic both believed they were powerful and had purposes within their beliefs. All right, now let's talk about death. Uh, so death within the Nordic and Celtic are actually very different. Again, within the border regions, you're gonna have some similarities, uh, but for the most part, it seems that the Celtic belief system believes in reincarnation. Now there is an other world that exists and you can go there after death, but it seems to be this exchange of when something enters the other world, something comes into our world and goes back and forth. And so there's an exchange of energy when it comes to the life and death cycle. And this is not something we necessarily see within the Nordic belief system. Uh, within Norse belief, we have the concepts of the halls of the gods. Now, to what extent this is, is again up to personal interpretation. And so the primary hall, of course, is Valhalla, which many people know about, the hall of the slain. The other one known about is Hell, where the sick and the old go. And Hell and Valhalla are typically where people's knowledge base drops off when it comes to the Norse. And this is because we don't know that much about the other halls. But every single god in Asgard, or at least the prominent deities, have a hall. And so a common belief, and it's shared by myself as well, is that you can go to these other halls as well upon your death. This is kind of where the information stops, and so you have more of a, you know, 
different afterlife when it comes to uh, the Norse belief system of you're going somewhere in the spirit world, uh, and then you have the going into the other world and then possibly exchanging uh, within the Celtic as well. And we do have artifacts to help back this up uh, within the cauldron found in Denmark, uh, which was Celtic or, or Gallic. There is an image of basically reincarnation occurring with men marching one way and then falling and then coming back into new life. And this is again a theme that we see throughout the Celtic world. We may actually find a little bit more commonalities within burial practices because burial mounds are prominent throughout the Celtic world or pre-Celtic world, uh, but also within the Nordic world. I've seen burial mounds all over the world, uh, and so burial mounds are a common belief. And there are mounds here from the Celtic era that contain grave goods and offerings showing that there is a journey into the next life, just as burial mounds in the Scandinavian countries that and contain these, these pots of liquids of food going into that next life as well. Again, I'm going to argue that the Nordic is different because they also have the boats. Boat graves are very prominent across Scandinavia. Uh, the ones I think of often are the ones in Gotland, which are basically rocks shaped in the, in the form of a boat, and people were both cremated and buried in them. And so the motif of a boat being a part of the next life seems to be a commonality. Where as far as I know, there are no Celtic graves found with these boats in them. So there is a distinction there between the two burial practices of the Celtic and the Nordic. But ultimately, our information is very limited on the afterlifes, and uh, this is going to be a debate of humanity going forward into our history, and, and the only people that know what happened when we die are the ones who do die. And so whether or not it's reincarnation with the Celtic, or if it's going into the individual halls of the gods with the Nordic belief system, or if it really is just Valhalla and Hell, we're really not going to know until that fated day comes. Before I leave, you can see the ring around here. That's all of the original pillars of the original hinge, all the circles here. Uh, and then of course I'm standing on the burial chamber that apparently contained three different graves. Uh, and then the Christian graves are over there. Uh, so yeah, 5,500 years of history. They very much believe this was a very sacred gathering spot, they specifically said, uh, for rituals of the past absolutely love that and i realize i've been saying karen popper this whole time uh it's not lure it's karen popple so i apologize for that but such a beautiful place to experience scotland and the spirits that exist here still to this day all right now on to our next location Well, I didn't make it very far down the road before I found something truly unique that I think you'll like a lot. And it'll be a great spot to talk about modern paganism within the Celtic and the Nordic. Uh, so let's hop out of the car and show you what just happened to be on the side of the road. Seriously, can you believe this right here? It's just a stone circle on the side of the road. Now, I will say I'm pretty sure it's a modern recreation because there's no signage or anything like that. Uh, and there is a modern grave here in the dead center. I mean, whoever was here was definitely a pagan enthusiast or probably a pagan uh, as there is an altar stone right here. Someone buried in the center of a stone circle that's been made this definitely has an interesting presence to it. And I want to take you to this little hut I see in the distance, which I'm very curious about. I don't know what in the world's going on here, but I think we can confirm pagan activity for sure because you literally have like an altar plate in here. And I looked it up. This place is called Persephone's Temple. Like it's this spot right here. Uh, once again, stone circle right over there with a hill in the background. And then this. Now this is very interesting. Uh, and so this is, I think, a good spot to talk about uh, Celtic paganism as it survives today. Uh, and really Norse as well and, and European in general is it's a lot more subtle. 
It's not going to be something that's big and, and aggressive. It's going to be subtle things like this on the side of the road. I, can, I don't know who built this. I assume it's the farmer over there. Uh, I don't know if they did it for a pagan purpose necessarily. But the roots of what this is, is pagan, uh, regardless of that. Uh, so it's just steeped in tradition and in history of the land here. Uh, and that's true uh, in my time in Denmark and Germany as well. Of a lot of people who practice traditions that I would argue are pagan traditions uh, that just do them a part of their everyday life. And I, I find that uh, in Europe, Celtic and Nordic and Germanic paganism are more just part of everyday life for the people who practice it. Uh, whereas in the States where the, these revivals are happening, uh, it's a little bit more aggressive, it's a little bit more different, and, uh, you know, I'm starting to recognize that. I think the biggest takeaway I've had from experiencing both modern Nordic paganism and modern Celtic paganism uh, is everything comes down to mutual respect because everyone's practice is going to be different because of how scattered our information is from the past. Uh, and so everyone's going to practice a little differently. And so no matter what, as long as there's mutual respect among practitioners of Celtic or Nordic, I think that is what is most important. Uh, and understanding that in North America it is different than it, here's, it is here in Europe. Uh, I like how it is here in Europe. It's more more subtle at times. Uh, it's more in things like this um, than necessarily, you know, a big explosive things. Whereas in the States, we're still trying to figure things out, I would argue, uh, because everyone in the States has such a muddled ancestry. Uh, you know, we're all 10% of something and, you know, we're all just trying to figure out our roots and, and try to figure out uh, ancient traditions. And I think we're still figuring that. We're in our baby steps. We're having to learn again uh, in a different land after hundreds of years of not doing it. Whereas people here, most people that still do it have been doing it for hundreds of years. Uh, so yeah, it's in a very strange spot. Uh, but ultimately, as I, I, I like to say, is that I think paganism ultimately is quite simple. It's about uh, connecting with nature. Uh, it's about connecting with the deities uh, that you follow and venerate. Uh, it's about celebrating the holidays. And those are going to be different for Celtic and Nordic. Uh, and so that might change depending on what you believe in. But ultimately, it's about the simplicity of life. Uh, it's about connecting to the nature. Uh, you know, these were agricultural based religions. Uh, and so returning to that, I think, is what a lot of people seek. And so whether or not that is Celtic or Nordic to you, I think you'll be quite happy in the simplicity in life you'll find honoring the old ways, no matter where you find them. Welcome to the Livingston Stones here west of Edinburgh and Livingston. What I want to talk about in this spot is the pagan practices of the past according to the Celtic and the Nordic and what we know. So like much of the information here, it's very scattered of what we actually know about historical practices and the reconstructed forms of these practices today are very similar when it comes to the Nordic and the Celtic, uh, but there's going to be some nuances. The main difference that we know historically between the Celtic and the Nordic are the Druids. So Druids, if you don't know, are essentially the priest class, the leadership class of the Celtic world. And at one point they had a network spanning the entire Celtic region. Uh, and the problem with the Druids is they didn't write anything down. They did everything orally, uh, but they were the spiritual leaders of society and even the political leaders, military leaders. And that's one of the reasons why the Romans sought to destroy them. Uh, and that is often considered the end of the Celtic pagan era, I think, uh, is when the Romans destroyed the final Druids and, and, and killed them all off uh, because they were the ones that held the knowledge of the ancient Celts. Now, when we actually talk about the Nordic, we don't know that much about their religious leaders. We do know that the Germanic people really saw spiritual power within women and that women could connect to uh, spirituality, but also to the gods and could even divine prophecy of the future. And this is confirmed by the fact that we have the Norns weaving fate, carving fate, uh, that we have Volva is one of the only surviving ideas we have of these ancient traditions, ancient leaders. Uh, and so Volva and Sather magic is something that is still practiced somewhat today, but just like the Druids, we really don't know that much information. Now, when it comes down to the actual rituals themselves, this is where we really don't know that much. We do know that the Celts and the Nordic people both divine things from nature. We know the Druids would go to oak trees uh, and look for signs from the gods. They'll look for signs in nature with birds flying by or the weather changing. And we see the same thing with the Germanic people and even into the Slavic people. Uh, weather changing, animals uh, coming during offerings or coming during rituals were seen as a good sign. And a lot of pagan tribes across Europe, even outside of the Celtic and the Nordic, 
Uh, they were very superstitious. If something uh, was an ill omen, they would be like, nope, we're not doing this. So they really listened to omens. They really listened to signs from nature. Uh, so that's definitely a commonality that we see. When it comes to the actual rituals themselves, this is where we really don't know that much. This is where a lot of modern interpretations and, and, and modern ideas come in, because we know the basics of ritual, we just don't know the details of ritual. Uh, we know there was some form of offering, there's possibly some form of incantation as far as calling out to the deities, and then we know there was some, you know, meaning and purpose behind the ceremony itself, an exchange of gifts between yourself and the divine or whatever you're reaching out to, uh, you know, even if that's the spirits of the woods, giving gifts to the spirits, giving gifts to the house spirits, the elves. These are all traditions we see across Central and Northern Europe, including the Nordic and the Germanic and the Celtic. Uh, this is one of the reasons I focus so much on things such as house spirits, because this is a commonality we see amongst everything in Northern Europe, is giving offerings to house spirits of acknowledging house spirits. And so we might we may not know the like full details of honoring the gods within the Celtic or Nordic world, but this exchange of gifts seems to be very universal among the two. Now another key difference when it comes to the actual veneration of deities or the celebration of a religion is the holidays that they celebrate. And we do know I would I would argue probably more about the ancient Celtic celebrations than we know about the Nordic and Germanic, only because with the Nordic and Germanic, we really only know about the Yule celebrations and the Midsummer celebrations. Everything else is modern interpretation and historical speculation. Uh, so we have a lot of references to Yule. We have some ideas of what Yule celebration and Yule feast was like. We know about the swearing of O's on hams. Uh, and then modern Midsummer, as exists today in Sweden, it's the most popular holiday in Sweden still to this day. And a lot of the traditions that are done during Swedish Midsummer now are the same traditions that were done in the past. But as far as the spring and fall celebrations, again, this is where it gets a little loosey-goosey because we have less information about it. We do infer that they had spring celebrations and autumn celebrations, uh, but typically it doesn't. we just don't know the details. Uh, even the spring goddess of Germany, Ostara, we know almost nothing about besides her name. Uh, so we can say, oh, Ostara is the god goddess of spring, but as far as the celebrations around spring, we really don't know that much. Now, as far as the Celtic, we know about the fire festivals. We know about Imbolc, we know about Beltane, we know about Lunasa, and we know about Samhain. Some of the details are a little foggy on these, uh, but for the most part, we know a lot of details about them as they were celebrated for hundreds of years after the pagan era ended. Beltane probably being the most known because Beltane continued to be celebrated until really the 1950s in popularity. Uh, it took a break and now it's even coming back. Uh, so the Beltane traditions of having two bonfires, you would lead the cattle around uh, to have the smoke and the sacredness, and then you would have dancing. Uh, there's things about, you know, healing and, and making prayers and wishes at Healing Well for the next year. Uh, so there's a really rich history around Beltane still to this day. And again, that's just not something we necessarily get the details of, of a lot of the celebrations within the Nordic. Now, the actual dates of these may be a little bit different than you expected because a lot of people know the holidays by the Wiccan Wheel of the Year. Now, while some of these are correct, they're not exactly the same. Uh, and this is a, a subject I've been kind of talking about for a long time. Just know that the Wiccan Wheel of the Year is used by a lot of people. Wicca is very popular. However, as far as historical reconstruction, it's not quite right, specifically with like the Yule celebration, because Yule technically, historically, was based on the lunar calendar, and so it wouldn't be on the solstice, it would be on the full moon after the solstice, or the final full moon of the year. Uh, and so it's not going to quite fall on the solstices and equinoxes. Having said that, many modern pagans choose to celebrate on the solstices and equinoxes because the ancient, ancient, ancient pagans did this as well. And so, again, maybe not be a Celtic site, Stonehenge is not a Celtic site, but oftentimes they align with the solstices and equinoxes. And so we're kind of skipping over a little bit, but we're saying, hey, the ancient people, ancient, ancient people recognize the solstices and equinoxes. So a lot of people, modern pagans today, uh, Celtic and Nordic alike, choose to celebrate uh, the holidays on the solstices and equinoxes. So I just threw a lot of information at you. Again, Simplicity is key in my opinion. Uh, really, we look at the commonalities here, and there are commonalities of religious practice, at least what survives from the ancient past. Get together around a seasonal change, celebrate the gods of that season, give them gifts, make prayers and offerings for the coming year, make dedications to the next year, uh, for the next cycle, and celebrate. You know, with winter, it's going to be more about coming in. Spring, it's gonna be more about coming out. 
Summer, it's going to be more about celebrating the work you've done, taking a break from working in the fields or in the office, and then fall is going to be celebrating the hard work and the festivities and all this stuff, but also the veneration of the dead. Hopefully you've been able to tell. I can't give you everything about Celtic and Nordic paganism in this video, but I hope I've been able to bring together at least an idea of their similarities and differences. And again, I would argue that the deities are quite different, a lot of the traditions are quite different, but there's some things at the core of what paganism is that really bring them together. Thousands of years ago, the Celtic people held celebrations for the ancient deities, including the Dagda and the Morrigan, celebrating with fires and festivities, all led by the Druids, which kept sacred knowledge for hundreds if not thousands of years. And at the same time, from the Nordic and the Germanic world, we have stories of Odin and Thor fighting giants and trying to stop Ragnarok. We have stories of ancient goddesses like Freya or Frigg that possessed witchcraft and sorcery that they taught to the gods. And then of course the legends of the Vikings and the raids and how far they explored and the mystery around the gods they followed. Both of these belief systems are unique, fractured, and absolutely beautiful. And while they may be separate, I do truly believe that you can have experiences with both the Nordic and the Celtic deities as I am here now in Scotland, worshiping the Norse gods, but still feeling something from the land here, the magic and the celebrations that are still held today here in Scotland.